Now, as the final speaker, I believe it is imperative that I tell you a story. And essential that I take you on a journey. Therefore, I shall do both. But first, the story requires just a little bit of imagination. So I'd like you to imagine for me a 12-year-old boy. This 12-year-old boy is sitting at a desk, and he's got a book. But it's not just any book. This book is actually, this book is actually Fermat's Last Theorem by Simon Singh, perhaps the greatest popular mathematical book ever written. Now, Fermat's Last Theorem here is on the screen is so famous perhaps because it took 396 years for it to be proven after it was first postulated. Now, as the boy continues to read this book, what the author of the book has tried to do is sort of give an idea of the events that led to this historical proof. And in the reading of those events, he comes across a statement. It is one statement, a single sentence that is not very long. But it was a statement that changed everything, the course of his life. And in case you haven't already figured it out, that 12 year old boy is me. This was the statement. Not all true statements can be proven. Now I'd like you to stop for a second and take in the gravity of that statement. The gravity of that statement to this particular boy. Now this particular boy has a deep-seated belief. This belief formulates the basis of his entire existence. And this belief is the belief in the certainty which we can get to using logic. He was at heart a physicist. He believed that the only way you and I would ever get to absolute truth is through the use of logic. Nothing else came close to logic. Logic was the only way forward, and logic was all there really was to it. Now for that boy to come across this statement, for someone to tell him in a popular mathematical book that was published that you can't prove all true things, is very troubling. He stared at the book and he looked up and he stared at the book again and he looked up again and he couldn't make sense of it. But immediately he knew that he couldn't let this single discovery go unexamined. So I am brought upon a journey which led me to Star Trek. I lied. What? You lied. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Remember that. Everything Harry tells you is a lie. Listen to this carefully, Norman. I am lying. You say you are lying, but if everything you say is a lie, then you are telling the truth, but you cannot tell the truth because everything you say is a lie, but you lie, you tell the truth, but you cannot, for you lie. Illogical, illogical. Please explain. You are human. Only humans can explain their behavior. Please explain. I am not programmed to respond in that area. Now, the, the guy whose brain just blew up isn't really a guy. He's actually a machine. He's a humanoid. Looks like a human, but he's actually a machine. And he's the bad guy, and obviously the humans on the two sides of him are the good guys. And their job was to get out of the situation that they were in. Now, how did they do this? They made the guy's brain blow up. Um, how did they do this? They, they told him one thing, one single statement. And this single statement is on the screen now. I'm a compulsive liar. Now, maybe in a half-joking way, or not so serious way, I myself have used this sentence many times in my life without understanding the difficulties that it poses. This statement is very difficult. Why is it difficult? Well, the Greeks knew about this. The classical Greeks knew about this statement. And for a thousand years, two thousand years even, they couldn't resolve it. Why is it such a problem? Consider, just consider, 
for a moment that this sentence is true. If it's true, it says it is lying. Therefore, it must be false. All right. Let's just imagine it's actually false from the beginning. If it's false, really, then it's telling the truth, which must mean it's true. So if it's true, it's false. And if it's false, it's true. <laughs> OK. We have a problem on our hands. We like to believe every single moment of our lives that everything's either true or false. There's no third. There's no middle ground. But then what do you do with that? <laughs> OK. We will embark upon now the journey that I was led to in my investigations. And this journey begins with a simple thought experiment. Now, all of us in this room, I require all your help in this. We will conduct this thought experiment now. <laughs> all right. In this thought experiment, I have a printer. It's a magical printer. In fact, it's so magical that it's the most magical that ever existed. But it's magical because it functions in two specific ways. The first way is that my printer is honest. If I go to my printer and lie to it or tell it something false, it will refuse to do anything. It'll just sit there. If I go and lie to my printer, it will do nothing. It's honest. But also, if I go to my printer and tell a truth, tell a true statement, my printer will print it out. It has to print it out because it's complete. My printer is honest and complete. All right. My manufacturer comes to me and hands me this printer, and I am faced with a singular question of whether it really is magical or not. Now, I need all of our help in determining whether this printer is magical or whether I've been ripped off. So we begin. We will assume right now it's cloudy, hope you know in our heads. It is cloudy, and it is not sunny. That's my assumption, and that's true. All right. Now we have to go to our printer. This is where it begins. I will now go to my printer and make a few commands up, just to simplify life. I will say p is a command, and p is just an abbreviation for I can print. np is also a command. It's an abbreviation for I cannot print. And in those little quotation marks, I'll put something else. I'll just put something else after P, put something else after NP. Fine. We will now begin our investigation. I go to my printer on one day and say it is cloudy. Well, it is cloudy. The printer knows that, so the printer prints it out. Great. No problem. Then I go to the printer and say it is sunny. Well, it is not sunny. It is cloudy. The printer knows it's false. So the printer does absolutely nothing. All right. Until now, things have made sense. I need you to hang on to the peculiar feeling that everything makes logical sense. That feeling is of singular importance. So hang on to that feeling, because we're going to blow things up. All right. Now we make things a little more complicated. We now introduce our commands. I'm going to go to the printer and say, P, this cloudy. Remember that P was merely an abbreviation for I can print? All right. I go to the printer and say P it is cloudy, or I can print it is cloudy. Now the printer considers a sentence and says, well, it is cloudy, therefore it is true, therefore I can print it. Therefore, P it is cloudy is true statement. And the printer very happily goes and prints it out. No problem. Then I go into the printer and say, and P it is cloudy, which is the exact opposite of the first statement. It's false. And the printer does nothing. Now, just a few moments ago, I asked you to hang on to the feeling that everything makes sense. This is where we blow things up. This is what it all comes down to. We are now faced with one final sentence in our examination. The sentence is called the Gödel sentence, so named after a mathematician named Kurt Gödel, who created the sentence in 1931. What is this sentence? The sentence is called G. And G says, NP, NP. NP, NP. 
Now my painter is dumbfounded. OK, the painter does not know what to do. It requires our help. We have to find out whether the sentence is true or false, or what is it. And that is our next step. All right. Let's consider MPNP. MPNP merely stands for I cannot print, I cannot print. It's kind of a repetition of itself. And this sort of repetition of itself is called self-reference. Because if you consider NPNP has been formed by plugging NP into itself in the quotation marks. So NPNP is what you would call self-referential because it can talk about itself. All right. Now that we've established what NPNP is, we need to consider whether it's true or false and help my printer out because it's quite scared. All right. So let's say for the sake of argument, my printer decides to print it out. OK, it's been printed out, but it says that it can't be printed. So if you print it out, it becomes false. And I've printed out something false, which I can't do because I'm honest, right? I'm an honest person, or the printer is at least. It can't print out something false, but it has because if you print it out, it becomes false. All right. Now, let's assume again that I do not print it out. Now, if I do not print it out, that's exactly what it's been saying all along. G is saying it can't be printed. So if it can't be printed, it's true. And I have failed to print out something true. And I am therefore, by definition, incomplete. So if I print it out, I am dishonest. And if I don't print it out, I'm incomplete. <laughs> OK, we are faced with a problem. Actually, it's my problem, kind of, because my printer is not magical anymore. I investigated it. I gave it a sentence. And it tells me that I can't print it out, nor can it not print it out. So what does it mean for me? Well, I'm stuck. Because my printer is not magical, it can't be honestly complete. It just can't be, no matter what. I can't make a printer which is honest and complete. There can be no such printer. All right. That's great. Now, this is all very good as far as magical printers go, but when did we ever see one? Actually, we didn't. Now, I want you to consider this. What is the printer? The printer represents something in our real lives something very important, and I have been using it all this time as an analogy for something a lot bigger. What is that? The printer's aim is to get us to all true statements without getting us to any false statements. The aim of logical reasoning is to get us to all true statements and no false statements. The printer is merely an analogy for logical reasoning. And in our thought experiment, we have been using this printer as a sort of a scapegoat for logical reasoning. But then again, whatever is true for my printer is also true for logical reasoning because the printer is just logical reasoning. So what does that mean? There is no magical logical reasoning. What does that mean? Well, to be, to be magical, you have to be honest and complete. You have to get me to all truths and avoid all falsehoods. But logic can't do that, can it? Because we've just shown that. We have just now, in our little escapade, shown that logic can't be honest and complete, cannot get us to all true statements. Now, logic is actually peculiar, because logic is actually used by mathematicians, it's used by physicists, it's used, it's used by economists, it's used by social scientists, it's used by all of us in this room. All of us in this room cannot function without logic. Logic is an inherent part of our existence. So what does this mean for us? What is this even? Well, the thought experiment that you've just undergone is actually a formal theorem in logic. This theorem was proven by the mathematician I, form, I, 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 I mentioned just a minute ago, called Kurt Gödel. He proved this theorem in 1931. And when he proved it, there was havoc. There was panic. All the mathematicians who 
were dabbling in their language were shocked because this, this Greek paradox that was in the English language was also in math. But math is merely a language for expression. There was panic. They, they couldn't deal with this. They couldn't believe that they had been unable to resolve this paradox. And in fact, they found that you could translate this paradox into French, into German, into Italian, into any language, any language that exists. So long as it can have that sort of self-preference that I talked about, it's got a problem. It's got a big problem. If it's got a problem, then we've got a problem. And we need to ask ourselves now, what caused the problem? Consider for a second the rules of logical reasoning. Who made the rules of reasoning? Who made logic up? Well, logic is a human creation. And logic is present in our languages. It's present in English, in math, in all languages. Logic is present. Logic is used. Logical rules exist. And we made those rules, we put them in place. We put those rules in place. Why did we put those rules in place? Well, I put the rules in place because they made sense. Because I looked around at nature and how nature works, and I took these laws from nature, and I put them into my language, and they became the basis of my logic. And it served us well thus far. So what went wrong along the way? What was wrong with my intuition? Is it that I, or my intuition is correct? And logic is false, somehow, somehow inherently flawed? Or is it that maybe? And it's not outside the realm of possibility. Maybe it was the intuitive laws that were false. Maybe the set of laws of logic that we put in place because they felt true can be false. Maybe they were false. This is a problem we have to grapple with. But at the same time, it ties down to one final point. I showed you a little earlier a clip from Star Trek where the machine's brains were completely fried by the humans by being presented with that one sentence. I'm a composite liar. Um, the machine's brain blew up. But all of us in this room also saw the sentence. We also heard it, but our brains didn't blow up. Why is it that we human beings in this room were able to avoid that blowing up of the brain, whereas the machine's brain completely blew up? What is so different about the human being and the machine that caused the machine to be completely unable to deal with the paradox. We human beings, in fact, all of us in this room, just now not only saw the paradox, we also managed to prove that it cannot be resolved. That is an insight that we as human beings have just made. But the machine can't do that, can it? Can the computer do that? No. Can you make a machine do that? Not yet. This strange paradox that appeared a thousand years ago in some Greek city-state continues today to be the basis of a fundamental difference between human reasoning and machine reasoning. Human beings are peculiar because they can make that insight, because they can show no magical printer exists without having their, brain, their brains completely fried. This is a very peculiar human quality. Only we can do this, and we have done this. And I'll say it to you once more. The thousands of years old paradox, which seemed to appear out of nowhere, it was a pestilential problem that bothered logicians over the years, and they couldn't deal with it. It continues even now in the world of ever advancing AI, ever advancing knowledge, ever advancing technology. It continues to tell us something about what it means to be human, and that concludes our journey. Thank you.